This is one of the great classical actresses of America who is very humble about it. A disease she does not catch from me. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to ask her, she did something here two years ago and we've had so many people ask her to do it again. Oh. And it is about a hero heroine's journey. And it's a journey of someone who found their essence, who found their high quality, who found their entelechy. His. He was a no counting redneck mountain hillbilly from Georgia. But he knew music. Stephen Vincent Bernays, the mountain whippoorwill. Up in the mountains, it's lonesome all the time. Soft wind slewing through the sweet potato vine. Up in the mountains, it's lonesome for a child. Whippoorwill a calling when the sap runs wild. Up in the mountains, mountains in the fog. Everything's as lazy as an old hound dog. I was born in the mountains. I never raised a pet. I don't want nothing and never got it yet. I was born in the mountains, lonesome born, raised running ragged through the cockle burrs and corn. I never knew my pappy. I maybe never should. <laughs> I think he was a fiddle made of mountain laurel wood. I never had a mammy to teach me pretty please. I think she was a whippoorwill a skitting through the trees. I never had a brother nor a whole pair of pants. But when I start to fiddle, well, you gotta start to dance. Listen to my fiddle, kingdom come, kingdom come. Hear them frogs a chunking, juggle rum, juggle rum. Hear that mountain whippoorwill be lonesome in the air. And I'll tell you how I traveled to the Essex County Fair. Now, Essex County has a mighty pretty fair. All the smarty fiddlers from the south come there. Elbows are flying as they rising up their bow for the first prize contest in the Georgia Fiddlers Show. Woo! Old Dan Whelan with his whiskers in his ears, kingpin fiddler for nearly 20 years. Big Tom Sargent with his blue wall eye. <gasps> Little Jimmy Weezer that can make a fiddle cry. Oh, all sitting around, spitting high, strutting proud. Listen, little whippoorwill, you better bug your eyes. Tune a tune a tuning. While the judges told the crowd that them that got the mostest claps would win the bestest prize. Well, everybody's waiting for the first whittle dee when in comes a stumbling hillbilly me. <laughs> I vowed right pretty to the judges in arrest, took a silver dollar from a hole inside my vest, plunked it on a table, said, There's my calling card. And anyone that licks me, well, he'll have to fiddle hard. Old Dan Whelan was laughing fit to holler. <laughs> Little Jimmy Weezer said, there's one dead dollar. Big Tom Sargent had a yellow toothy grin. But I tucked my little whippoorwill spang underneath my chin and patted it and tuned it till the judges said, begin. Now, Big Tom Sargent was the first in line. <laughs> He could fiddle all the bugs off a sweet potato vine. He could fiddle down a squirrel from a mile high tree. He could fiddle up a whale from the bottom of the sea. You could hear hands spanking till they spanked each other raw when he finished variations on turkey in the straw. Little Jimmy Weezer was the next to play. He could fiddle all night. He could fiddle all day. He could fiddle chills. He could fiddle fever. He could make a fiddle rustle like a lowland river. He could make a fiddle croon like a loving woman. <laughs> and they clapped like thunder when he finished strumming. Well, next came the rock of the bobtail fiddlers, the let's go easies, the fair to middlers. 
They stood up, did their bicker, settled back for some more corn liquor. And the crowd was tired of their no-count squealing. When out in the center stepped old Dan Whelan. He started fiddling nice and low. Listen, little whippoorwill, you gotta spread your wings. He fiddled with a cherry wood bow. Old Dan Whelan's got bee honey in those strings. He fiddled the wind by the lonesome moon. He fiddled a most almighty tune. He started fiddling like a ghost. He ended fiddling like a host. He fiddled north. He fiddled south. He fiddled a hard right out of your mouth. He fiddled here. He fiddled, he fiddled salvation everywhere. When he was finished, woo! The crowd cut loose. Whippoorwill, there is rain on your breast. And I sat there thinking, what's the use? You fly home to your nest. But I stood up pert. And I took my bow. And my fiddle went to my shoulder. So. And yeah. Wasn't no crowd to get me phased. But I was alone where I was raised. Up in the mountains. So still it makes you scared. Where God lies sleeping in his great white beard. And I heard the sound of the squirrel in the pan. I heard the earth breathing in the long night time. And I thought, they fiddled sinful and they fiddled moral, but they haven't fiddled the brushwood laurel. They fiddled the rose and they fiddled the thorn, but they haven't fiddled the mountain corn. They fiddled loud and they fiddled still, but they haven't fiddled the whippoorwill. So I started off with a dumb little dog, and hell broke loose in Georgia. Skunk cabbage growing by a big arm stump, a whippoorwill, you're singing now. My mother was a whippoorwill part, my father, he was lazy. But I'm hell broke loose in a new store shirt to fiddle all Georgia crazy. Swing your partners up down the middle side. Sash ain't not, ooh, listen to my fiddle, flapjacks flipping on a red hot grill and fire in the mountain, snake in the grass, Satan's here a bowling, oh, Lordy, let him pass, go down, Moses, set my people free, pop goes a weasel through the old Red Sea, Jonah sitting on a hickory bow, ooh, up jumps a whale, and where's your prophet now, rabbit in a pea pouch, pass him in a pot, try and stop my fiddle, now my fiddle's getting hot, what will say? Singing in a mountain hush, we were shouting in a burning bush, we were crying at the stable door. Sing tonight as you never sang before. Sing on the mountain, little whipper will. Sing to the valleys and slap them with a hill. Cause I'm floating high as an eagle's quill. And hell broke loose. Hell broke loose. Hell broke loose in Georgia. There wasn't one sound when I stopped bowing. Whippoorwill, you can sing no more. Somewhere other the dawn was growing? Oh, mountain whippoorwill. And I thought, I've fiddled all night and lost. I'm a good hillbilly, but I have been bossed. So, I went to congratulate old man Dan. And 
he put his fiddle into my hand. And then the noise of the crowd began. wonderful audience to be with. Thank you. And then the noise of the crowd began. Hmm. There then occurs in this journey part that gets all the stories. The road of adventures. And it's generally a series of initiations. Initiation from in idiom, a new beginning. Also from the word in iri, to go within. To go within, to get as the Zen Buddhists say, that beginner's mind, that new beginning, to rid oneself of the calcifications of one's life, the habits, the toxicities, and get to that primal place in which one is always eternally available and eternally pure. Many traditions of initiation. In the West, alchemy, taking salt and sulfur and saltpeter, and in the grinding of minerals, you're also grinding away the toxicities, the calcifications of yourself. And then firing yourself in the alembic of new possibility, so that you're reconstellated the gold of yourself. Many other kinds of initiations. Initiations of what? Give me some examples of ones that you've been through. New kinds of awareness. Accidents, yes. Yes, if, you're not, if you don't take an initiation, they're going to grab you. They will find you. Zen Buddhism, the Zen koans, you crack your mind upon impossible ideas until your mind gets honed. Often with these initiations, it isn't enough just to have them. You often then need some kind of ritual stru structure to let you know that you've transited. Ritual from the Sanskrit, Rita, Rita, art, music, discipline, the dance, the open door of transition. Now we have a lot of rituals in this culture, mostly in sport. You don't believe me, the 11 young heroes on the football field, carrying the holy egg through the womb of the goalpost, while the ersatz virgins dance and scream on the side, you know. That's a ritual. The holy diamond, I needn't tell you about that, the divine crystal, and the nine, the Ennead. Rituals are deeply, deeply, deeply within our psyches. Perhaps they are even part of the older part of the brain, the old reptilian amphibian complex when we are highly ritualized, ritualized for survival. I went to 29 schools before I was 12 years old. I, I didn't get kicked out. My daddy was riding the Bob Hope show, so we were always on the road. And the reason that I stayed reasonably sane is we always had the same thing, whether I went to school in Bemidji, Minnesota, or Biloxi, Mississippi. We had the salute to the flag, we had the prayer and the collection of the milk money, you see. And that appealed to that old brain. If you're going to move, if you're going to transit, if you are going to be transparent to transcendence, and by God, you need some very regular kind of behavior, always even if it is a kind of order of brushing your teeth in the morning, but it's got to be there. But what the higher rituals do is they take these ancient events of transiting, of transformation, and they carry you to the next level, where you are then grounded in the next level. How many of you have a PhD? 
I took two. You know what I did after each one? I got sick. Because there was no whoop de doo There was no celebration. Think about how many young people, adolescents, in 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, what did they get? Really hair-raising rites and rituals, rites of passage, dying to their old self, being buried, being reborn, welcomed with great secrets and mysteries, honored. They died to themselves and they were born to another self. Why do we have so much adolescent suicide? It's because they don't have a hero's journey or heroine's journey. You know, they're given a bar mitzvah, they learn a few lines in Hebrew, they get a confirmation, nothing. And so there is always some level of the self that has to die to its childhood that needs a level of powerful disenchantment and re-enchantment, as you have, for example, the Native American Kachina rites. The powerful, powerful, you know, rites coming in, and the people coming, hey, 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 Dancing in, thundering in with the heads of gods. And at that point that the secrets are revealed that the masks are taken off and they realize that the God is in the human and the human is in the God and the disenchantment and the re-enchantment, and they die and are born to a new condition. And I think if we have, and I've done a certain amount of work with this, in our junior high schools, in our high schools, in our churches, powerful rituals of death and resurrection, of dying and reborning, hero, heroine's journeys, vision quests, outward bound, whatever form they take, but in a highly charged ritual music dance, then these people will not have to commit suicide. What do you say? <laughs> Similarly, in friendship, how many of you have old friends? And it's sometimes we need recommitments, transformational recommitments to Boy, am I going to be difficult for you and you'll be difficult for me. <laughs> and that we hone each other. Regular deepenings, I think, of the marriage bond, of the friendship bond. So many things need to be raised to a level of sacrality. You see, and that is part of the initiation. Raised to sacrality. Taken from its trivial and filled full of numinous, filled with meaning. In these spectacular adventures, these are always challenges to go beyond one's toxicity and to take on, in order to survive, you have to take on the depths of which you were apart. Now the modern road of trials is not the old road of trials. It isn't monsters. It's often inadequacies. I talked about the Wizard of Oz. A little Wizard of Oz music, please, maestro. Do you know it? Sure you do. We did it 14 times once. Okay. Follow the yellow brick road. Help him. Because of those he does, because of the wonderful things he does, the Wizard of Oz does. Because, 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 because. American myth. brick road, I mean, follow the saffron path, follow the blood path to the depths, starting out in dreary old Kansas, this little anima filled with light and her great, you know, shamanic little dog, Toto, and of course the great spiral, the great cyclone comes and blows them away out of dreary Kansas to a world that is near Oz but isn't Oz and there she meets the disenchanted ones the disempowered heart who is Tin Man the disempowered brain if I only had a care crow disempowered gut <laughs> the lion and they got and they know that if they could get to the source place to the God self Oz who's a fake Disenchantment, you see? It's the old ritual. 
then by God they re-empower God they re-empower him and they and he empowers them you know they get beyond the fake to the real fake beneath all this glitz is the real glitz you know and so in that re-empowerment they enter into the green world because they've come from the wasteland and then she takes the green world to Kansas it's a, it's a classical it, it speaks to the deepest things of our soul I've often wondered if poor Judy Garland who essentially reached a pinnacle at 15 or 16 years old but then was not allowed because she had become iconized and was not allowed to be human and stayed on drugs until she had to die but what if they had had the sense in Hollywood in what was it 1939 to have really brought her through see she was the through which same with Elvis and many of our rock stars uh, what do they say the music the music's in the the rhythms and the music and the music's in me and they become deified because they're it's like voodoo they are the loa they are carrying the god but they're not the god but this country that doesn't know what to do with gods projects onto them and then they have to stay hyped up to be able to deal with all this projection no rites of passage we need rites of passage for movie stars i grew up with so many of them so i really know that we need rites of passage for ourselves now, in the Oz story, the disempowered mind, that is one of the greatest challenges. Did I tell the Billy story here when I was here last? All right, disempowered mind. In 1968, my husband and I were the subject of a five or six page article in Time. Everybody began to get in touch with us. And um, a lady began to call me from Northern Michigan insisting I come to Northern Michigan and speak to her ladies club. She sent telegrams, she sent letters, uh, I mean, it, it, she phoned all the time, so of course I went. Can you bring in the, the hero's journey here? Notice the aspects of the, of the journey, because here is the I'm being called. And called and called and called. And called refused and, and refused. refused and refused. And furthermore, it was not, it was not practical. I had to come on Tuesday. And you had many responsibilities. And many responsibilities. I had uh, no car fare, no airfare, no anything, and I had to go. So I went. And I spoke to the women's club, and guess what? No reaction. The end of it was. Maybe that was another call. I said, well, thank you very much. I enjoyed myself. Uh, now I can catch the plane. It's snowing. No, you have to come home with me, says the lady. I have to come with only why? because it's important coffee and cake All right. I sit down the fire no you can't sit by the down by the fire you have to come downstairs in the basement Ooh, <laughs> crossing the threshold it really was a crossing so we go down in the basement if you ever find yourself in the middle of an adventure don't try to get out of it So down in the basement, there we are, across the threshold, realm of amplified power. She turns on the light. The place is filled, little tiny room, but filled with crazy inventions. Upside down lighthouses for submarines. <laughs> Revolving goldfish bowls for tired goldfish. <laughs> and then something called easy off whisker remover and it was just some powder and it had this little thing on it it said the man should put it on his cheeks in the nighttime it will cause the whiskers to grow inward overnight next morning he bites them off <laughs> and it was filled with things like this and i said to the lady well now i know why you invited me here you invited me here because of your husband's patents no did you invent these things no who invented this billy and there is this rather small 12 year old boy sort of cowering on the side i said you did this yeah, you, you, you invented all this. Yeah. I said to the lady, well, you must be so pleased having such a brilliant child. And she said, I'm pleased. I'm glad you are. Teachers aren't. He's plunking out of school. I said, how in the world is that possible? He said, she said, I'm very glad you asked that, Miss Houston. You thought I invited you here to speak to my ladies' club. I said, no, madam, I strongly suggest you did not. She said, you're right. I invited you here because of Billy. I am convinced, I am convinced if we can find ways of reaching children like Billy, so many lives can be turned around. So many people can 
live their life instead of living as stunted, aborted versions of themselves. And I said, well, you've obviously thought a great deal about it. She said, I certainly have. I'm going to show you something. Billy, come here. Here's pencil. Here's paper. Here's a tape measure. Now, you know how you learned how to compute the area of a room. Ma, do I have to? Yes, you do. Oh, all right. So he took very careful measurements, and then he began to work. And he worked, and he worked, and he worked, and he worked, and a tear came down. And after 10 or 15 minutes, he gave us the wrong answer. A very tiny room turned out to have the dimensions of this t tent. And his mother said, well, of course that's wrong. And he said, of course. And she said, well, now do it your own way. Oh, OK. He went back to the uh, measurements, and then he went, dum da dum ba dum ba dum And he gave us the right answer. I said, hey, kid, what are you doing? You're thinking in images, right? You know, because I'd studied thinking in images for years. You think in images, you don't think one, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, D, E. You think one through five, five through 10, A through L, L through Z, whole gestalts of information. The mind races, synthesizes, chooses, selects, does the work of months, sometimes in minutes. Many highly creative people think in images of one form or other. I said, you're thinking in images. He said, yes, but more. I said, well, what more? He said, well, <laughs> when I think in my own way, it's like a cross between music and architecture. I said, that does it, okie dokie. <laughs> Picked up the phone. I was teaching at a girls' Catholic college. Uh, Sister Margaret Mary, could you please take my courses in, in Hegel and phenomenology and Plato and, and existentialism and Sartre? <laughs> I just had a big schedule. Uh, because um, I, and I told her when I was there, I said, I have to stay here for a while. She said, oh, yes, Jean, anything for the greater glory of God. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh. It was wonderful teaching in girls' Catholic colleges in the late 60s and early 70s. The nuns had just kicked the habit, you know, and had <laughs> leaped into the 21st century. It's when the lay Catholic clergy claimed that it was something else. But anyway, I got away with murder. So um, I took the, the fellow, the kid, to the uh, IQ, very famous IQ place, one of the great universities, and he was given an IQ test. He did terribly. 85. I said, that's OK, kid. Don't worry. Now you do it your own way. He said, that's not possible. I said, what do you mean it's not possible? He said, Gene, this test is made for people with your kind of mind. It is not made for people with my kind of mind. I said, you're right. He said, I am. I said, never mind. Look, let's take another test. You tell me how to ask the question. He said, that's going to work. I don't know. We'll try for fun. OK, first question. Can you make it sing and dance, Gene? The question sing. Da, 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 da. So I tried. OK, second question. Gene, can you make that question look like a building from Frank Lloyd Wright? lived in Michigan, remember. And I really tried. Well, to the eyes of the horrified statistical psychologist looking on, we got through that test. I have never been so tired in my life. <laughs> and they marked it. 135. 50 points over a period of a few hours. Well, next day, armed with truth, armed with scripture, the IQ. And wagon loads of his crazy inventions, I went to see the principal. Here is the principal. You ever see the, the picture, American Gothic? <laughs> that was the principal, about 65-year-old gentleman. So I presented the IQ. I presented the, um, uh, the inventions. I talked about him. I said, he thinks in music. He thinks kinesthetically. He thinks in images. And he's not being reached. I went on and on and on. Then I waited. Dead, utterly dead. And finally, <laughs> <laughs> laughing and crying, I said, Sir, is something wrong? You bet it is. Well, what? He said, I was a student of John Dewey at Columbia University in the 1920s. He talked about all this stuff that. But I bought into the system. I became superintendent of schools, principal. I took the bureaucratic way out, and I betrayed my own master. He said, what the hell? I'm 65. I'm going to retire in the spring. I could do one thing to justify myself. John Dewey, let's do it. And he called in the other teachers. 
We showed them the inventions. We showed them the IQ test. Oh, IQ must be true. Oh, yes, said I, looking heavenly. <laughs> I said, he thinks differently. He thinks in images, he thinks in music. Give me some tests that he has failed. Well, that's all of them. No, no, give me, let's say, three. So we went through the tests in the same way, and he passed. He didn't do great, but he passed. And I said, I'd like to stay after school and over the weekend and just find out some ways of working with, with Billy. And four out of five, the teachers agreed. The fifth did not, <laughs> very sourly. And the, then Billy said, can we bring in Sally? Can we bring in George? I believe they think the same way I do. Sure, we brought them in. These children taught us more about education than I have ever gotten in any education courses. Example. One of the other boys said to the history teacher, Mr. Hayden, when you teach history and you put all those dates on the board and you talk about George Washington crossing the Delaware and I couldn't care less and I forget it and it doesn't stick, why can't you make it like Star Trek? Well, what do you mean? Well, have me close my eyes and you tell me about George Washington crossing the Delaware and then you add the facts and, and my mind makes the pictures and I, I know I remember it. And Mr. Hayden said, well, yes, I could do that. But, Mr. Hayden, why does George Washington have to cross the Delaware anyway? Well, because he did. No, no, why not have him die and drown? <laughs> <laughs> and then let me see what happened to American history if George Washington had drowned. I mean, what a great idea, alternative history, you know, and then you go back to regular It's a tremendous idea. I mean, this is the real making of historians. A lot of history books I've read lately, I assure you, are alternative histories. <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> Maybe it's for that boy. Um, then the girl said, Ms. Schwartz, I, I just hate mathematics. I throw up before every test. I hate it, I hate it. And I was seeing Star Trek too and about a queen of a planet. Why couldn't you make me the queen of the planet of math inside my mind? And I close my eyes and the little figures and numbers that come up to me and they love me because I'm the queen. And, and, and they take me around, they show me how it works and I don't think I'd hate math anymore. Tremendous idea the lifting of a symbolic block. Don't kid yourself, a block is a very real protein-based physiological thing. A lifting of a symbolic block at the core. Well, these children taught us so much. <laughs> and then what happened is I followed Billy's career. All the children within a month were passing. And the teachers really tried and they went way beyond us inventing things together. And then what happened I followed Billy's career. He went on, he got a B minus. He never got beyond a B minus till he got to graduate school in design engineering where he graduated summa cum laude. And his whole personality changed. He began to invent things for people as well as crazy inventions. So now a very fine design engineer. And I asked him years later, why is it you never got beyond a B minus? He said, because Gene, of the tests, there were so many multiple choice tests, A, B, C, D. I couldn't help it, Gene. I had to be true to myself and I put in E because I saw another way of doing it. <laughs> I believe the children are a future, sing along if you know it. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. Let the children's laughter remind us we used to be everybody searching for a hero people need someone to look up to never found anyone to fulfill that need a lonely place to be so I learned to depend on me I decided long ago to walk in anyone's shadow If I fail, if I succeed At least I lived as I believe No matter what they take from me They can't take away Yeah.
inside of me. And so, the hero's journey of adventures now. It's going to Two, you and I are too big. Another diet, okay. Uh, another day, another diet. <laughs> uh, we're both originally from Texas, and we have those kinds of homes. Um, the disempowered heart, the disempowered mind, the disempowered spirit, those are the big challenges and the re empowerment. The re empowerment of these capacities. So let's do that. Let's begin with a kind of brain exercise. One that is a challenge. Would you sit next to somebody that you'd like to do a little exercise with? You, it doesn't have to be with your spouse or your spice, you know, it can be with uh, you can wander around and you can sit up here. It and it's one, one that's going to lead to choices. Make sure it's one other person. It will not work with two. Turn towards one other person. Move rows if you person. have to, so you're sitting next you to one other person. What this is, is an activation of imagination and intelligence and thinking in different ways. And what we're going to do is we're going to activate internal images, thinking in different styles, as a kind of delightful cha mutual challenge. We're going to begin with visual images. For example, I might say, Peggy, I want you to see a performance of Hamlet done in ballet tutus, everybody. <laughs> then we wait until I do that, which takes quite a while with Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> and then I say something like, Jean, I would like you to see a sunset at Sunion, that Greece. cape in Greece where there's the temple to Poseidon and the sun is setting at, in the west and the full moon is rising in the east. Isn't that nice? <laughs> <laughs> Peggy, I would like you to see my little dog Saji, my Airedale, as she leaps into the swimming pool at that divine moment caught in flight. Jean, <laughs> I would like you to see Antarctica and the great penguins who hold the great eggs on their feet. Visual images, back and forth, and then uh, we will interrupt you in about a minute with the next level of it. Let's start with visual images, and it's going to lead to a complex use of mind, and then we'll get to creative choices. You need your eyes closed when you're imaging, usually. Now we're going to switch to sound. Peggy, I would like you to hear the sounds of the humpback whales in the seas. Songs of the humpback whales, I'd like you to hear them. Jean. I would like you 
to listen to the wind and in the middle of it hear the three strange angels knocking. <laughs> With a few strange angels in this audience here. <laughs> helping out. Peggy, I'd like you to hear John Denver singing a song to the earth. Okay. <laughs> How many of you want to hear that? <laughs> Forever. Okay, thank you. Sound. Sound, back and forth, images of sound. Touch now. Peggy, I want you to touch the skin of a newborn baby. The skin, touch the skin of a newborn baby. Jean, I would like you to feel your dog, Saji the Airedale, famous dog, who when she runs away goes to the woods and comes back filled with burdocks. <laughs> and mud. So I'd like you to just have a little time trying to get the burdocks off. Peggy, I'd like you to walk on coals. <laughs> touch, touch. Think cool green moss, think cool green moss. Cool green all right, we're moving now to smell. Peggy, I would ask you to smell a field in the morning of new mown hay. <laughs> Jean, I would like you to smell A pine forest. <laughs> Peggy, I would like you to smell a circus. I mean, a real old-fashioned circus. The kind, the kind that comes to little old towns in Texas. Smells. All right, we're moving now to taste. To taste. Peggy, I want you to taste a freshly baked angel food cake upon which is slathered bittersweet chocolate minted mousse with whipped cream on top. All those flavors. I want you to taste celery, spinach, and lettuce slime after it's been sitting in the refrigerator. <laughs> for three weeks. Peggy, this I'd like you to taste real Chinese thousand-year-old eggs. This is an exercise in trust, I think. Taste. <laughs> All right, now, here it comes. Complex imagery. Peggy. You are riding a horse through snow and sleet, carrying three little kittens under your coat, actually under your blouse. <laughs> While you are sucking on a peppermint. <laughs> Complex imagery. Jean. 
You are riding a burro. I'm sorry, we're both on horseback here. But you're riding a burro down into Grand Canyon. And a hailstorm begins, which is altogether possible. But you are hearing Ferdy Grofay. <laughs> Boom, 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 the Grand boom, boom, Canyon boom, boom, Suite is being played. That's right. There are a thousand birds singing that. <laughs> Above the canyon. They're bored with it too. <laughs> and you're wearing... Oh, a, a drum majorette's outfit. <laughs> and a Stetson hat and twirling a baton. Can you do all that? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. <laughs> no, one more. Peggy, dear. You are standing under a waterfall in Hawaii watching a nearby volcano erupt while little fishies are nibbling on your toes and you are singing, You Are My Sunshine. <laughs> Complex imagery, back and forth. Okay, now. Your minds are getting stranger and stranger, yes indeed. You're very much smarter than you were before, even though you don't know. <laughs> now, what we're going to do now for the next seven minutes is together we're going to take a mutual journey. The journey will be to the possible Earth. The possible Earth. And not only will you go there together, ways that we'll just demonstrate, but somehow you will get empowered there <coughs> in the future or in the dimension of the possible earth to come back and to make your creative choices here that will allow you to help make that possible earth. Now the journey is one of mutual imagery where each one of you adds to the images of the other. For example, if we were to start, it might go something like this. We'll just try anything. Peggy, we find ourselves First, we have to take ourselves down. Stepping through a closet, pushing the clothes away, and lo and behold, there is a door in the back of the closet. We open the door, and it leads to a stone staircase, and we begin to go down and around and around and down, and deeper and deeper and deeper into the very depths of the earth, and we see on the walls as we go down visions of the world's history and of ourselves in the choices that we made or that we that somehow nature empowered us to make to become mammal and human and we see the delicacy of those paths and and we follow somehow our own tracings as human beings, they're all visible there, and not only visible, we can touch them, and we hear the sounds of them, of this incredible earth history, as we continue going down and around and down and around. And as we go down, we come to a river, a dark river, there's a skiff on the river. We pull ourselves along, and we seem to be going through a tunnel, and out beyond the tunnel, it's as if the light changes, the world changes, there's a, a different smell even, a different taste in the air. And we have entered into another world, but it is this world, it is a different world. It's one in which uh, <laughs> old people seem to be educators. And, and children, children are playing and they are making things, music. I, I children are musical. educators, too. Children are educators, too. The music, you go into music rooms and you walk into the music, and if you play it by moving your body through the music, and, oh, it's a, 
a theater, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> and we see, we feel, we know the roles not only that we play and have played, but we can watch. Oh, we watch everybody, all our friends, everyone we know, everyone we meet. We see their roles and what they're playing and what part they play in this theater of, of our earth made almost new again. Okay. So together, you take each other down to a place. Down or up, however you go. But it's a mysteri mystery... Blah, blah, blah. It's a mysterious path. And then, back and forth, a possible society. You have seven minutes. Begin. Don't leave your part. Gradually beginning to come back and coming back and coming back from the whatever space you're in, coming up through space, through time, feeling an empowerment. And there's the cat just walked through. That's right, that's right. <laughs> yeah. How are you? Interesting ideas? What did we do? We did practices to activate what are called internal proprioceptors, inner imageries. The best way of activating inner imageries is not just to sit there and listen to a guided meditation or do your own imagery. The best way to get the activation is something that has a kind of very deep energy between without and within. Thus the challenging of images, visual, auditory, <laughs> auditory, olfactory, taste, <laughs> and that's by the, you know, see, auditory, I smell time, I hear color. If we had time, I'd do the other things, synesthesias, cross-sensing. Margaret Mead, who I worked with for years, uh, was perhaps the finest sensate person I've ever seen. That's why she had so many ideas. That's why she had a phenomenal memory. I would say to her, Margaret, um, Tell me about the Arapesh incest taboo. She said, oh yes, I discussed that with George Devereaux at the Red Loaf Conference of 1937, and he was wrong. Characteristic statement of Margaret Mead. <laughs> well, how can you remember? Well, you said the incest Arapesh, and I thought food, 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 bread, Red Loaf Conference. She was cross-sensing all the time. Margaret wasn't fat, she was just impacted with information, you know, all over her body. <laughs> Um, cross senses, when you cross sense, that's another thing. Hearing color, smelling time, the Australian Aborigines, the Kalahari Bushmen, people who are close to Earth, many Native Americans cross sense all the time. But what you did, you see, is by challenging, you activated the internal proprioceptors. And if you keep at it, you're going to have a very rich imaginative life. When I studied Margaret for years, Rorschach test, I'd give her Rorschach test, 50% right down the middle between fantasy and action. Her famous action world was just as deep within as her internal imagery. That's why, you know, most of us, opportunities come to us, and, they, and the opportunities say, you hoo hey, <whistles> woo! You say, nothing ever happens, nothing ever happens, nothing ever happens. <laughs> With Margaret, it was like this, mm -hmm. her tongue was there all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, ha, ah, oh, yeah, ooh, I can get that, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. act. And it was this great, you know, consonance between inner and outer worlds. But as you activate these inner worlds, you activate your resonance to external possibilities. And you get the courage and the guts, you know. If I only had the nerve, you get the nerve. A lot of the nerve has to do with the template of possibility being activated inside. Your images, your creative intentions are strong enough, juicy, feisty, green enough. And then if, as you build it up, it becomes a reality in the world, you see. Because then you have the courage to make the choice and to act. Also, it helps activate capacities that have been repressed. I've never met a stupid child. I've met incredibly stupid systems of education. You know. So part of empowering capacities is empowering schools to empower the whole brain, mind, sensitivity. Some people think in images. Some people think in words. Some people think kinesthetically. Some people are like Proust. Mm -hmm. They eat a cookie and here comes the remembrance of things past, you know. 
There's all kinds of thinking. We need art back in the curriculum. <laughs> because an art allows you to do whole processes, beginning, middle to end. An art teaches you how to weave in terms of color, in terms of form. You see, and it's just the question of the activation. As, as we are moving into multi, multiple cultures, as we are now in America, like Canada, we're not a melting pot, we're a multiple cultures. We really, in order to honor these cultures of black and white and red and yellow and all these peoples who are keeping their integrity as the Earth's new story is a story of many parts coming together but not melting, then we have got to empower these different styles of thinking which rise from these different cultures. And that is part of the great educational adventure and the road of trials of the next 10 and 20 years as the peoples come up from the south and come in from the east, you see. Now, another aspect of the road of trials is always the question of betrayal. Betrayal is an ominous, sacred thing. All great legends and myths have betrayal. Christ must have his crucifixion and betrayed. Otherwise, no upsy-daisy. It's betrayal, wounding. The wounded heart, betrayal is awesome. I mean, you see it there in Genesis. You see it there in, <laughs> in the Christ story. The whole Bible is a series of betrayals. The great legends are abandonments, betrayals. Betrayal always means great faith in someone who you feel in union and connection and empowerment, and then suddenly they are not there for you anymore. It's generally from someone who is close, not a stranger. And when we feel betrayed, often what happens is that we can fall into the hard shell of alienation and distrust. We can fall into distrustful fixations. Oh, never again will I ever trust anybody. Or self-hatred. I will never write an exquisite love letter again. I will never reach out in that manner. Or we may even fall into cynicism. Ha ha, never again will I go so high. I'll stay here on the dog and chase my own tail, you know, on the floor, cynic, cynic, cynic you know, the, the dog. Or paranoia, <laughs> the whole world's got it in for me, you see. And if we fall into that hard shell of paranoia or revenge, an eye for an eye, a toot for a toot, or cynicism or self-denial, we court the crash in ourselves and others. And that is why we can, we have got to begin to probe the stories, the great woundings in ourselves for the deeper and mythic base. As I said, all myths have deep psychological wounding at the heart of them. If they did not have that wounding, then the god, the goddess, the person, the hero, the heroine would not be vulnerable. They would not be full of holes. And it's being holes, full of holes that makes you holy. Because that vulnerability, you see, allows you to then to reach out to people whom you normally would not reach out to, or to ideas and to be responsive if you don't fall into these deficiencies of alienation. And so it is, as part of this journey, the opening of the wounded heart to holiness and sacrality and not just to band-aids. And I'm going to ask Mr. Dr. Robert Gass, who is a master of heart midwifery to lead us in this process. I'd like you to turn once more just briefly towards the person, the partner you were just working with. If you do not have a partner, raise your hand. And make sure to find one. Someone over here who's missing one. Anyone else missing a partner? Okay, and just decide very briefly, one of you is going to be partner A. It's of no great consequence. Just decide between you who's partner A. Okay, when you've done that, I'd like you to turn towards me again. Turn towards me again. And close your eyes, please. Close your eyes. As we did before, take a deep breath and hold it. Hold it. Hold it and let it go. Deep breath in and hold it. Hold it. And let it go. 
deep breath in. And let it go. As you breathe in now, draw your breath into the center of your chest, to what's known as the heart center. Feel your breath come into the center of your chest. Breathe at your own rate. But each time, feel your heart and feel your breath come into your heart. What's the first thing that you're aware of as you bring awareness to your heart tonight? As you breathe in the next time, I'd like you to imagine that you're inhaling a light of golden color. So do that now. As you breathe in, imagine breathing in light of golden color and bring this light into the center of your chest, into the area of your heart. With each breath, very gently drawing light in. This light is strangely familiar. You know this light. Somehow you know this light. Be like an old friend. This light has healing properties and it's warm. So as you breathe in now, imagine a warmth coming into your chest with your in breath. Each time you breathe in, fill your chest, filling with warmth and with light. In a sense, of a healing touch upon your heart. Breathe into your heart. And as you bring awareness and bring light, this healing energy into your heart, you may also become aware of the places in your heart which in some way feel blocked or closed or wounded. For in the heart, we carry the memories of a lifetime of incomplete experiences and unhealed wounds. You may experience them like little pockets of contraction, little closed fists, or places that seem dead or almost where there's no feeling in the heart. But as you breathe in light, these places will seem even more illuminated by contrast. You'll notice, you'll know where there's closed or woundedness. Breathe into your heart and be aware of these woundings of which Jean spoke. For in the heart we carry the memories of betrayal, of abandonment, suffocation, of abuse, psychological, physical. Because we've each had our hero's journey, and in each of our journeys, we have had these woundings. Sometimes they're now buried under many years of thinking we're grown up and past all these things. Soften your heart now. Be aware of wounding in your own heart as you breathe in light again. And let your own heart, let your own heart's wisdom show you right now some place in your heart which is in need of healing tonight. Trust your own heart and let it show you now some place in your heart which is in need of healing tonight. And breathe in. This healing will not come into your heart and into your life unwelcome, unbidden. So if you're wanting a healing or an opening for your heart now, in some way ask for that. As if your heart could speak out its prayer to life. As if your heart could ask for healing, for peace, for wholeness. Let your heart actually sound the words in your chest silently. As if you were sounding the words of your prayer in your own heart. But call out now to the spirit of life and ask that the spirit of life come into your heart and bring you this wholeness and this healing and this full feeling of your own woundedness. 
For it is in this full feeling that we find our aliveness. Breathe into your heart. And as I sing to you, let the words and the music come into your heart. If it feels right, you can also place one or both of your hands over your heart as you hear the music. Some say love. It is a river. Breathe open. Drowns. The tender reed. Some say love. It is a razor. Your soul to bleed. Some say love it is a hunger, an endless aching need. I say love. It is a flower. And you, it's only seed. Breathe and let your heart soften. It's the heart that fears the breaking, that never learns to dance. It's the dream that fears the waking that never, never takes the chance. It's the one who won't be taken. Who cannot seem to give And the soul Afraid of dying That never Never learns to live In your mind's eye now I'd like to see the face of the person who in this lifetime, past or present, living or dead, has been your great teacher of the heart. The person from whom you have most been able to receive love, past or present, and see their face appear in front of you now, as if they were standing just two or three feet in front of you. And in your mind's eye, look into their eyes and see their eyes looking at you. And remember what it feels like to be seen by these eyes that love you in this way. And as you breathe in, feel their presence close with you in this room. And remember what it feels like to be in the presence of this one who has loved you in this way. And as you listen, you hear them speaking to you because they have come today to bring a message to your heart that your heart very much needs to hear. So open yourself and receive this message. When the night has been too lonely And the road has been too long you think that love is only for the lucky, lucky and strong. Just remember in the winter, 
far beneath the bitter snow lies a seed that with the sun's love in the spring becomes the rose and now one by one see other faces beginning to appear see all the faces of all the people who in this life past and present, all of those who have loved you and have been a part of the fabric of your heart. And as each of these faces appear, let your heart speak out your truth to them, whether it be the truth of your love, your closeness, the truth of your anger, the truth of your fear, the truth of your separation. But as each of these faces appears, let your heart speak out silently its truth to them and hear the truth that they bring you tonight. Perhaps love is like a resting place, a shelter from the storm. It's here to give you comfort. It's there to keep you warm. And in times of trouble, when you are most alone, the memory love will bring you home and all these faces are appearing some of them are surprises some people you would not expect to come but they've all come in some way responding to your prayer to your call out to life so receive them tonight as they gather perhaps love is like a window perhaps an open door it invites you to come closer and it wants to show you more And even if you lose yourself And don't know what to do The memories of love Will see you through The septum is like a cloud To some as strong as steel for some way of living, for some way to feel, and some say love is holding on, and some say letting go, and some say love is everything, and some say they don't know. And now they're all gathering around you as if they were gathering in a circle of healing and they're reaching down their invisible hands to touch you and you can feel their invisible hands upon your skin and some of them are reaching right through your chest and you can feel some of them coming right into your heart of hearts to the place where you have dreamed and believed that you are alone because they're coming to bring you the message that you are not alone that you are loved love is here and available if you have the courage to reach out, to be soft and vulnerable. Perhaps love is like the ocean, full of conflict, full of change. Like a fire when it's cold outside, or thunder when it rains. If I should live forever, and all my dreams come true My memories of love would be of you If I should live forever And all my dreams come true My memories of love would be of you.
would like those of you who are partner A to open your eyes gently. Those of you who are partner B, you keep your eyes closed. Partner A, turn towards partner B. Those of you who are partner B, you keep your eyes closed. Partner A, turn towards partner B. And take your hands and place them three to five inches above their body. And your job for the next few moments is to let your hands be a channel for all the love that's available in this room and in this world to bring healing to this heart that is reaching out for wholeness, for healing. And as you feel ready, you can let your hands come down to touch and trust the wisdom of your hands. Your hands know how and where this person needs to be touched for their healing and for their holy. Trust your hands and let them do their work. Those who are receiving, you have only one job, only one responsibility to life at this moment, which is to take it in, to receive, to let the circuit be complete, to let the circuit be fulfilled and the circle be fulfilled. So you just keep breathing and draw this energy in to where healing is needed in your heart, in your whole body. Those on the outside will be singing. Those on the inside, don't sing. Let yourselves be sung to. Their tears, tears are part of the washing and cleansing. Let them happen. See me, feel me, touch me, heal me. Those on the outside will sing. See me, feel me, touch me, heal me, see me, feel me. See me, feel me, oh touch me, heal me, see me, feel me. See me, feel me, oh touch me, heal me. See me, feel me, touch me, heal me. See me, feel me, touch me, heal me. See me, feel me. See me, feel me, oh touch me, heal me. Keep breathing, goes the center. See me, feel me, oh touch me, heal me. See me, feel me, oh touch me, heal me. See me, feel me, oh touch me, heal me. See me. Feel me, oh touch me, heal me, see me, feel me, oh touch me, heal me, see me, feel me, touch me, heal me, see me. Close your eyes, those of you who are just giving energy. Those of you receiving energy, gently opening your eyes now and turning towards your partner so they complete the circle. And those of you who are about to give energy, bring your hands three to six inches somewhere around this person's body. Those of you about to receive, use your breath. Each breath is a choice to allow, to allow the vulnerability, to let your heart feel, to let your heart open to all of its full range of emotion, sensitivity. Each breath you have that choice to soften. Those on the outside, let your hands come to rest. 
this person's body. Trust your hands, let them move as they will to support this person in their healing, in their opening and holding. Those on the outside will sing, those on the inside who are receiving, let yourselves be sung to. May the long time sun shine upon you. All love surround you, and the pure light within you guide your way home. May the long time sun shine upon you. All love surround you and the pure light within you guide your way home. May the long time sun, may the long time sun shine upon you. All love surround you, all love surround you, and the pure light within you, and the pure light within you. Guide your way home, guide your way home. May the long time sun, may the long time sun shine upon In this environment, in this realm of love and loving, in this place in the great journey, it is the place where the heart begins to be healed and thus the hero heroine becomes capable of what 
in the great journey is referred to as the sacred union the meeting with the beloved of the soul this is a very very ancient story doctrine myth peace of the human psyche and it's very modern and it is rising everywhere I remember in my first meeting working with Mother Teresa of Calcutta and I said to her mother how can it happen that you can do so much when you do things that the Red Cross can't do you do things I mean you, little children are left one day old and you give them a good education a good life the lepers find meaningful lives for them you know. it's so many people the dying Hindu man on the street of Calcutta whom you give a noble Hindu dying to how can you do so much and she said my dear it's because I'm so deeply in love I said your mother love mother she said, oh, yes. I said well would you mind telling me who you're in love with she said yes she said I'm I'm a nun and I'm married to Jesus I said yes of course all nuns are she said no no you don't understand I really am and she said I am so in love with my beloved that I see the face of my beloved everywhere she said I see it in the day old child and I see it in the leper and I see it in the dying person see the people who need care and new kinds of hospital care now of course she's working with age she said and I'm so in love I can't do enough for my beloved and then she actually sent it to me my beloved can't do enough for me <laughs> well, that's what's fun now she being a nun of course her beloved was the cultural archetype which for her was Jesus for some Buddhists it's Buddha for some Hindus it's Krishna or a great variety for you and me it tends to be that archetypal beloved of the human soul and you can't just dismiss it as some mere epiphenomenon or some mere wish fulfillment because there's too much smoke <laughs> and there's too many people who truly have made great choices and made a difference and I've known some of the great ones of our time and in almost every case they have when you really came down to it they spoke about this profound relationship with whatever you want to call it the archetype of which they are the exotype the depth pop part of the soul the God self within but seen emotionally experienced as the beloved and often it did not come until there had been fairly substantial heart wounding and also a release of heart feeling and deep reaching out and then they began that tender coming to attunement communion and a sense that they were profoundly in partnership with the beloved they walk with the beloved they talk with the beloved they practice that presence they celebrated it and it became so real whether it was seen as a cultural archetype or something that was deeply personal and unique to you but however it comes it seems to provide the courage the communion the ideas it's as if you have the access to the ideas of this deeper creative realm in which the beloved in some sense lives and even if it is only a healing fiction there's no way you can absolutely prove it it has phenomenal evocative co-creative results in the world now it's not something that we can give you in a four-hour seminar we can only make suggestions at this state that you're in it is a released by something that the ancient Greeks referred to as pothos yearning it's a yearning and as you have a sense of that yearning you have a sense of that yearner yearning back and forth if you try to project it as a surrogate into another human being you will blow that human being out and they'll have to get out of there some of you may have had that experience but it is a practice of that presence until finally it is so rich that you are deeply in communion <laughs> and then you come back with the great boon 
you come back with a gift of love and seeing the reflection of the beloved in the school principal, in the autistic child, in the man with or the woman with AIDS, in the person born with a broken brain, and you cannot do enough because that beloved is reflected so profoundly in the other. And that is why we say ultimately, ultimately, with all you're getting, get love. <laughs> Not even understanding, I think. The next step for this world is it is a world of love. The world beyond ideology is the world of love. And so in the great story we find that they find, you find that communion. It is a practice. My last book, The Search for the Beloved, is about it. And how to get into this kind of practice. But then you start the path back. You have your allies. <laughs> You have your attunement of brain and mind and courage and intention. You have... You're ready. But coming back, there are always obstacles. And the obstacles are generally in the form of shadows that you thought you got rid of. But they weren't about to leave. I'll give you an example from a great story. We'll do it quickly. we we'll take the mic. The story of highly evolved beings, King Arthur and Prince Gaiwan. May I have some King Arthur music, please? Who are highly evolved, who have done the hero's journey, but who haven't really gotten back yet. Now you have to help me with this one. It seems that King Arthur and Sir Gaiwan, the perfect knight, the perfect knight, were galloping through the forest in their greens, not their armor, their greens. Will you be the gallopers for me? <laughs> They come to a ford in the river, and suddenly there jumps out in the middle of this ford an eight-foot giant whose name is Sir Sober Gomer Jower, and he says, ah, I got you! I've been waiting for you for ages, and I've got you, and now I'm going to make you fight with me! You're going to fight with me, both of you, and I'm going to kill you and eat you, and I'm going to be the world's going to be rid of King Arthur, thank God at last! But, but, sir, you're a knight, aren't you? Yes, of course I'm a knight. But, but, but we're not in, we have no weapons, we're not in our armor. That isn't a knightly thing to do. So what? Oh, all right, all right, I won't fight. I won't fight today, but I'm going to give you a challenge, all yes, right? Yes, love challenges, this that's what we do. This is a guardian of the threshold, please notice. I'm going to give you a challenge. Yes. And this is the challenge. Yes. You've got one year. One year. You've got to... Get out! You gotta go ask people questions, and the people you gotta ask questions is those people that you put on those, on those, what do you call them? Pedestals. 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 You gotta ask the women questions, and the question you gotta ask is, yes. what do women really want? Oh. And you gotta get the right answer, and you gotta bring it to me in one year or else, chung, 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 that's the end of you. We'll go, we'll go, okay. Arthur, you go this direction, I, Guy, one, we'll go in this direction. <laughs> Excuse me, madam. Madam, what, what do women really want? I don't know why you think we should tell you. Uh, old lady, old lady, what, what do women really want? Well, what I'd really like is a nice warm fire in this tent. A little girl, little girl, what do women really want? Well, what I want is somebody to beat up my brother. Oh, the abbess of the order, holy abbess, what do women really want? Something that they cannot express to men. <laughs> Pretty lady, you and all those colorful clothes, what do women really want? Something they cannot express to men. <laughs> Guinevere, Guinevere, what do women really want? Go ask Lancelot. <laughs> A whole year goes by. A whole year goes by, they've got 20,000 answers in the scroll. They come up to Sir Summer Gomer Jower, and oh no, they don't come there. They, they realize, they go through it, and they realize, oh my God, it isn't right. We haven't got it, we haven't got it. And Sir Guywin says, Sire, uh, I have a hunch. If I'd have, just go into the middle of the forest, I have a hunch something is calling me, I can get the right answer. Well, all right, one more day, okay. But then tomorrow we gotta deliver, okay. So he goes into the middle of the forest, and he sees in the middle of the forest a well. And sitting by the well is a shape, a strange, warped shape. And he ascertains that it is properly a woman, but 
Excuse me, madam, um, what do women really want? And there turns around the ugliest woman in the world. Her name is Dame Raglan. She is so ugly. Her eyebrows are woven into the top of her hair. Nice. She's got long tusk tooth. She drools like a mastiff. Great bandy hump in front and behind. Many little dots of all colors. Yes, madam. What do women really want? Ah, I know you. You've been talking to my brother. And you know what? I know the answer you do, to that you do. question. Yes, I do. Oh, well, what now, what will you do for me if I give you the right answer? Anything you say. All right. Will you marry me then? Huh? How do you feel about that? <laughs> I am Sir Guy when the good and perfect knight. On the on my honor, it's a good and perfect night. I'll do whatever you ask me. Okay, in front of everybody, me in a beautiful white dress and a lot of folks around. Right, right, right. Will yes. you you'll get you'll marry me? Yes, right. Yes, Here's yes. the answer. Yes. What women really want yes, is yes. sovereignty. Oh, that sounds right. Next day. <laughs> They go to the summer gomer jower and there he is. All right. We, we have we have we have the answers. Here's the answer. All right, let's see. Oh my goodness, who have you been talking? What kind of a challenge is this? You don't have any idea. How to, didn't you take any exercises in your brain? Don't you get any answers at all? We, None of these are right. We're in for fighting. We're not for wrong, thinking. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, oh, we have one more. What is it? What women really want is sovereignty. You've been talking to my sister. That's yeah. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Next week, the wedding. Here's the beautiful Sir Gawain in green and gold. So beautiful, so elegant. Here's the court of King Arthur. The ladies in wimples, the men in the gold. And I may, here's the beautiful Gawain. The women and the men are passing out in horror at what is walking down the aisle. I need the marriage sort of thing. Come on, come on. Uh, Come on, come on, come on. No, no, marriage music. <laughs> now, now. And the priest says, do you, Sir Guy, wouldn't take this woman for your wedding? Yes, on, on, on my honor, is a good and perfect night, I do. Uh -huh. And do you, Dame Raglan, take this poor soul for oh. your wedded husband, have to hold this for this, 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 this? I do, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. Then comes the wedding feast. Oh, food! Nobody can eat. They're throwing up watching her eat. She inhales whole boars stuffed with sheep stuffed with lamb stuffed with partridges stuffed with bees. And it just drools and gobbets of flesh coming out from her tusk and old wine and it's awful. Then comes the wedding night. There is Sir Gawain lying there. Well? Yes, madam? Aren't you supposed to do something? What, madam? Well, you might kiss me. Yes, madam, I will do that and more. On my honor as a good and faithful night. <sighs> And it doesn't feel like Dame Raglan. And he turns around and looks up. And there is the most beautiful woman in the world. And he says, Where, where's Dame Raglan? Oh, my dear, I'm Dame Raglan. What happened? Well, the story is that I was in sore salt. And that's what made me look the way I did. And I am still in sore salt in part. So we have a choice for a healthy environment. Because I am in Sorsold, I can be beautiful for you at night and ugly for the others in the daytime. Or I can be beautiful in front of others and ugly for you at night. Which would you prefer? You choose. <laughs> well, since you have given me sovereignty, I can be beautiful all the time.
story of the Lady of the Shadows. The story of the shadows. Coming back from your choice, from your union with the beloved, from your sense of deep empowerment. Guess what's going to happen? The shadows, but the person of the shadows. Notice it's a lady by the well. What does the well represent? Wisdom, depth, the unconscious. She is the one, the rejected one by the well, who is sitting at the well of deep gnosis. It is the shadow person. But when the shadow person is seen in terms of who and what he or she truly is, they become luminous. In a sense, history is the present shadow. Is history a shadow cast by eschatology, cast by final glorious things that we don't see? Think of your own lives. Think of what are your Dame Raglans in your own character. Often they are the parts that you dislike the most and you dishonor. They may have even been repressed parts. For example, if I were to be terribly honest with you and say what my Dame Raglan is, on the surface, this is what it is. I am very hypersensitive. Hypersen I should live in a cave, raise air diet dales, and play Bach on a, on, on a recorder and translate ancient Greek poetry. That should be my life. Not, chase, not chasing and facing 150,000 people a year. I am morbidly unright for what I do. But that hypersensitivity, you see at the shadow level, at the depth level, what does it do for me? Sensitivity, sensitivity to others, to cultures, to what is trying to happen. So by focusing at that depth quality, the beloved, the Dame Raglan, the other quality redeemed, it becomes that which gives me my, my momentum, my sense of possibility, and my work in the world. If I were to come among you, any one of you, and you were to tell me, just give me an example of really, what is your really lousy character or quality? And then we would just look at it at the depth and see what is its depth luminosity. Does anybody want to come forward? Yes, come. What would it be? A righteous superiority it comes through. A righteous superiority, okay. Now I'm just going to guess, okay? I think it is acute sensitivity to beauty. <laughs> oh, at the depths. And of the sense of beauty, both the aesthetic, of timing, of rightness. It's an artistry in the soul. And it is a sense of creative order which when it gets warped and narrowed up at the surface comes out as a righteous sense of what should be. Does that speak to you at all? It fits exquisitely. That's an example of the depth. Anyone else? Yes. I see not enough instead of okay. You see? Not enough instead of okay. I see things as not enough, as not okay, as, as not enough. That, that should be more. There should be more. All right, then what I would say is that at your depths, it's a kind of a richness of an emotional life. <laughs> a rich emotional life. It's, it's a richness that perhaps you have not looked at and have not focused on. So that when it comes up, it's like the emotional shades because you are not dealing with that immense richness that you really have as access to. It then leaches out the surface of the world. Does that speak to you? Yes, thank you. Others? Yes, please come up. I, I procrastinate. I do. You and a lot of other people here. <laughs> Stuart. The depth of procrastination is often 
a sense of what we would call kairos, loaded time. Time that is the right time. <laughs> time that is the time that is loaded with possibilities and presence. High time. And that in the deeper life you have the sense of that right time and the time that is right to act. And that time that is the, the breakthrough, the go-through time. And that's very potent in you. And because you have not given yourself access to this profound sense of timing, that right loaded moment when things can truly happen, when the world unfolds itself, you have belittled time on the surface and procrastinated. Does that speak to you? Thank you. Do you see what I'm talking about? And so one of the things that you have to think about is what is your Dame Ragland that when you then give her the fullness of her sovereignty at what at her depth, you find your glory. Because your negative quality is often at its depth, at its well. It is where your most creative and potent force. And so I would ask you to think now about what it is. Those of you who are angry all the time, raging, it may be again that fullness of emotional juiciness. Ah, that was Margaret Mead. Mm. You know, she used to get her energy that way. Uh, she's the only person I know who kept all her hate mail. She kept her hate mail and she would open it and read it from 10 or 15 years ago to give herself energy, ah, you know, and then go out in the world because she had an incredible intense emotional capacity and yet it would come off on the surface as rages and tantrums you see those of you who feel anybody here you don't raise your hand feels inadequate and and less than they should and or or has to be the perfectionist and never feels anything is right or good enough and and they're not worthy any of those here let me just give you a suggestion often not in every case, but often you have been, for whatever reason, developing a guarded being within yourself. It's almost like you've been taking care of that high being, that exquisite high being, and nurturing them. And you're so afraid that you would shame them. And so you feel inadequate in the local self, not realizing that they've grown up by now and you are now in partnership with them. But often that profound sense of inadequacy comes from that sense of having nourished and nurtured that high being. Does that speak to any of you? So what I'd like you to do is just to think for a moment of what is your Dame Raglan and to be aware of her or him in their shadow sense is standing in front of you because often they are the ones who stop you because you have refused to acknowledge the depth of quality as you've only seen the warmth. And if you would all just stand up for a moment, we could take this to the end. Oh, and have that sense of that Dame Raglan in front of you. Can you have that sense? Can you also have a sense of the deeper quality who that is there and who is there? And believe it's there and to reach out to that being. This is the beginning of it, it's the ritual initiation. You'll have to think more about them, but reach out and have that sense of that glory, of that deeper quality that is there beneath the shadow. And then stand in their place, just move so you're standing where they were, and reach out from them to you. And having that sense of deep honoring and seeing. And now move back to you and see them. And if you can, embrace them. And have the sense of the depths rising that all your allies and the beloved and the empowered brain and soul and courage and to know that what had been there as darkness is really perhaps your most creative and compassionate and potent self.
I do not want to suggest that this is easy or simply a psychological trick. It is a mythic knowing. And reaching there, at least for the time being, see if there can be at least a few moments now of covenant, of agreement, to kiss the shadowed one, that he or she may turn into the beauty and may reveal the great depth of potential that is so deeply within you. And now with all of yourselves, with your human selves, with your great shadow Dame Raglan self, with your beloved, would you all just take hands for a few moments as we conclude, as we come back into the world just taking hands? Notice who's on your right, who's on your left, and would you make a lovely humming sound together? Keep the sound as I speak with you, closing your eyes. I ask you to hum and send your whole being to the person on your left and the person on your right whom you're aware of. Also send the sense of yourself and of the relationship of yourself to two other people who are in this room who are not standing near you. Have some sense of connection with them, with two others. So you're feeling a kind of connection between your whole being and with the beings on your right and left and those two other beings. There's a kind of mind, brain, soul, resonance with them. So that this entire room is now linked not just in body, but in soul and mind, a mind, brain, soul network. And I would like you to think now of four other people who are not here. Perhaps they're at home or in some other part of the world, whom you'd like to set up this kind of resonance or linking with. And linking with their mind, with their soul, link with their minds and soul, four other people and ask their beingness to send out links, each one to four others. And then their links to four others. And it is your humming that keeps the momentum that sends out further and further links to four others and four others. And in a few moments, the entire human population will be linked. And feeling these vast linkages, let the humming rise. These vast linkages of mind and soul and knowledge and spirit. In all these minds and souls linked together, we're creating a one a great brain, mind, soul of this unified planet. And now ask them all to connect with several animals as well so that the whole animal population is brought in. Dolphins and geese, dogs and mice, aardvarks and sloths, especially sloths, into the fish world now too, in the bug world. All animals and fish and the bacteria worlds. One great mind-brain system. And let the humming rise. And ask them to link the four others to link with four others who were not alive in their time and keep that going, not alive. The ones who have passed until everyone who has ever lived will soon be linked. The repository of their consciousness kept somewhere in the morphogenic fields, the plasma, now all linked so that all of knowledge that ever was and is is connected. And let the humming rise. And now this singing mind planet, there are 14, 1500 people in this room who are linked now with everyone. Keep singing it, keep singing it. Send it out to other planets, making connections with other planets and other suns so that the network is like a great network of planets and lives and suns until the whole galaxy is connected. All the minds and souls that ever were and are in the galaxy. And our galaxy is now connected and all that information in mind is flowing through you. And now let the galaxies connect. The minds and souls of all the planets in each of the galaxies connected so that billions and billions of galaxies are connected and sing it, hum it out. And the mind and soul of these galaxies, each island universe connected with other island universes, 
And it's all connected to the mind of being, what some of you refer to as the mind of God. The mind of being, keep it humming. Hum now the great connection. Hum now this mind with all its love and information and linkage and attraction and lure. And it is all in here and in under this tent now and getting softer and softer, softer and softer and feeling and knowing, keep it going, this great connection of mind and purpose and soul and intention, all this gnosis moving through you. It is all at hand, feeling the flow through of this, keep a subtle hum, hum going, subtle. All that ever were and are and shall be moving through you and the creative purposes of the universe finding their particular constellation, their particular crystallization and the focal point that is you in space and time here and now and feel yourself sung, frequenced, pulsed but now with a new mythos being that of science and space and of galactic complexity and the great organic soul, body, mind of this universe feeling yourself now being toned being pulsed, being frequenced in this great network of mind and body and soul that connects all of us to each other, past and present, the planet with each other, planets and other planets, galaxies, galaxies of galaxies, the mind and soul of being of all being. Feel this now moving through you so that you are pulsed, frequenced, leavened by love and let the humming rise in you now raise the roof space and time, the orchestrators of many worlds, pulsed by the God Self, pulsed by the energies and life forces that are merging through us in this most sacred time of history. And remembering the human heart can go to the lengths of God. Dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries cracks, breaks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flood, the flow, the upstart spring. Oh, thank God, our time is now, our choice is now. When wrong comes up to meet us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the largest stride of soul folk ever took. Affairs are now soul-sized. The enterprise, the choice is exploration into God. What are you making for, huh? Oh, it takes so many thousand years to wake. But will you wake for pity's sake? I know that you will.
Thank you.